You know us from the Hampton Conservation Commission, but tonight we're here representing the Seabrook Hamptons Estuary Alliance, uh -huh. uh, which is commonly referred to as SHEA. Um, SHEA is a nonprofit organization comprised mostly of members from the towns of Hampton, Seabrook, and Hampton Falls with the shared interest of protecting the Seabrook Hamptons Estuary. The Seabrook Hamptons Estuary is the second largest estuary in the state of New Hampshire and contains the largest salt marsh complex in the state of New Hampshire. Shea's mission is to protect the, the coastal and aquatic resources and preserve the Hampton Seabrook Estuarine system through education, community outreach, and research. And we appreciate the opportunity to spend a little bit of time with you this evening to share some of our recent and ongoing activities having to deal with coastal flooding in Hampton. Okay. Um, but before we get into the specifics of that, Rand's going to talk a little bit about the flooding itself. Okay. <clears throat> so what causes coastal flooding? Um, the term coastal flooding is not a new concept to Hampton. In fact, if you were to search the Lane Library historical photo catalog, you will find lots of impressive flooding images, some of which date back as far as 1919. However, it's not uncommon for people to think that coastal flooding only occurs during major, major storm events like hurricanes and nor'easters. But the image on this slide highlights the fact that there are several different ways flooding can occur, and it is when one or more of these types occurs at the same time that we see increased damage. The frequency and intensity of a flood event is also directly related to the property's topography and its proximity to the ocean or tidal marsh. So briefly, properties along the ocean front experience coastal flooding when there are large waves, high winds, and storm surge. While properties along our tidal marsh see flooding when there are heavy rains, strong winds, and elevated tides associated with storm surge. The damage on both sides is compounded when these events coincide with a high tide. Two of the biggest differences between the flooding along the marsh and the ocean is the marsh side is a lower elevation, which means they experience localized and roadway flooding when tides extend, exceed 10 feet. Mm. And flood events can last for multiple tide cycles when strong winds prevent tidal waters from receding. The next big question after understanding the elements of what caused coastal flooding is how often is it going to happen? As you can see from the last slide, the frequency of coastal flooding is greatly influenced by tide height and weather conditions. This slide shows the NOAA predicted Hampton Harbor tides that are greater than 10 feet for 2017, 2018, and 2019. Keep in mind that these predictions do not account for the impact of storm events. Based on these tidal predictions, it equates to one 10-foot or higher tide event per week. Mm -hmm. This means that property owners in high flood risk areas will need to adjust their normal travel routines, find alternative parking arrangements, and in some cases deal with flood damage. Yeah. If these numbers are beginning to make you think that high tide flooding is occurring more frequently, you are not alone. According to recent research by NOAA, the annual average number of days when water levels reach high tide flooding has increased by 75% along the Northeast Atlantic between 2000 and 2015. Wow. This study also found that in 2017, more than a quarter of the 98 tide gauges tide gauge locations that NOAA analyzed either tied or broke their individual records for the number of high tide flooding days. Unfortunately, the tide gauge in the Hampton Harbor did not have enough historical data to be included in this study, but the good news is the data from this gauge is now being incorporated into the National Weather Service's flood warning system. Hmm. Wow. The National <coughs> Weather Service now uses the tide gauge data from the Hampton Harbor to create what is known as a hydrograph. A hydrograph, as shown on this slide, uses the predicted tide heights, the hourly tide gauge data, and the upcoming forecasted amounts of precipitation to recalculate the expected tide heights for the upcoming 72 hours. 
The blue line on this graph shows the recorded tide heights for the past 72 hours, and the purple is the predicted tide heights for the next 72 hours. You will also see that there are three horizontal colors ranging from yellow to purple. The yellow represents a 10-foot actionable tide, and the purple is a major flooding with tides 13 feet or higher. The hydrograph that's shown in this um, slide is from the storm back in March, where there were several sequential tide cycles that ranged from 11 to 12 feet. Having this type of up-to-date tidal information is very important, <coughs> can play a very important role in helping to make sure property owners are aware of how the tides are reacting to weather and when the threat of flooding is increasing. We highly recommend that everyone bookmark, and you'll see at the bottom there's a link. Um, bookmark this link on their computers and on their phones. So to wrap up talking uh, just quickly about coastal flooding, I wanted to share some relevant information from our 2016 hazard mitigation plan. The graph that's shown here shows <coughs> the number of major coastal flooding events since 1968. As you can see, there has been a steady increase in the number of major events, which supports our perception that we are experiencing more frequent and intense coastal flooding. Another reason why flooding is such, has such a big impact on Hampton is that 31% of the structures in Hampton yeah. are located in the FEMA um, high, high hazard flood zone. And then 61% are located in the 100 year flood plain. Now properties that are located in the FEMA flood hazard zone are subject to special building construction requirements which help to protect the structures from flooding and flood insurance is mandatory if you have a federally backed mortgage. Now, property owners that are in the 100-year flood plain are often misled by the term 100-year flood because they think that it means there's a ch the chance of flooding can only happen once in 100 years. Um, but in fact, it actually means that there's a 1% chance that the flooding can happen in any given year. Mm -hmm. And if you apply that probability to a 30-year mortgage, there's actually a 26% chance in that 30 years of being flooded at least once. Ooh. Over the course of last winter, um, representatives from Shea and from the New Hampshire Coastal Program uh, have been speaking with Hampton residents um, about a variety of different flooding issues. And, and what we collectively heard was a lot of frustration because people had a lot of questions about flooding, no idea of what the answers were or what the resources were that they could turn to to get those answers. So Shea teamed up with the Coastal Program to host a series of three workshops to try to provide some helpful information and resources that residents could use to decide how to deal with local flooding issues. The workshops were held monthly from June to August. Uh, we averaged about 50 participants at each of the workshops and we're grateful to see municipal staff and board members there as well, including Selectman Waddell and Selectman Griffin, uh, Town Planner Jason um, Bashand, and Nancy Stiles from the Hampton Beach Area Commission. Good. The um, first workshop um, covered a discussion of the protective values of sand dunes and salt marshes, an overview of what causes flooding, and DIY projects that can increase your property's flood resiliency. There were a couple of major take homes from this workshop. Um, one that was sand dunes and salt marshes aren't just pretty to look at, but they really provide significant protection against storm surge and high tide flooding. And so it's in our best interest to protect and preserve those natural resources to the extent that we can. Secondly, that DIY projects such as elevating furnaces and water heaters, installing outlets higher up on uh, a wall can help make homes more flood resilient without incurring tremendous cost and without having to hire necessarily outside contractors. Mm. Workshop number, number two was focused mainly on two big flood insurance questions. Why is it important and what does it cover? Um, and this was followed by a more in-depth presentation and conversation about the process of elevating a structure to meet or exceed the FEMA requirements. Mm. 
Um, I think one of the more interesting aspects of this workshop was a conversation that actually Rayanne had with a Hampton property owner who had experienced uh, flooding damage during last January's storm. Her experience, starting with the emotional loss of her property to filing flood insurance claims and through the planning and permitting process of elevating her home was very relatable and educational to the property owners in the audience. And since then, we've probably had about five or six property owners come to the Hampton Conservation Commission looking for wetlands permits to elevate their structures. So clearly some of the fear of this process and some of the unknown of this process has been taken away. Yeah. Workshop number three, <coughs> excuse me, was organized around three strategies for dealing with flooding. Uh, one was keeping water out, which includes maintaining and enhancing our natural protective features, such as those dunes and salt marshes, utilizing floodproofing techniques, such as the installation of sewer backflow preventers, foundation sealants, and flood water shields on doors and windows. There was also a discussion about the pros and cons of barrier systems. They can work in some situations, but may be detrimental in other situations. So we really have to be careful about deciding universally that everybody gets a seawall because it's not always going to be to their benefit to have one. Living with water includes being prepared for flooding by including some or all of the following. Increase reaction time by listening to alerts, watching tide charts and gauges, having an emergency plan and a backup plan, carrying flood insurance, elevating the structure, including mechanicals above flood prone level, and improved drainage by reducing impervious cover. Getting out of the water's way includes parking and or staying on higher ground, reassessing how you use your property, understanding which areas are more susceptible to flooding, elevating or relocating your structure, or moving temporarily or permanently to less flood prone areas. The takeaway is that no one strategy works for every property. So knowing what you are comfortable with, what your tolerance for flooding is, mm -hmm. what you can afford, and what works best for your property is critical to developing a strategy that will work for you. At the end of the last workshop, we asked people what <laughs> thoughts and concerns they would like us to relate to you, the Board of Selectmen. And we're not looking for answers to these issues tonight, um, but we think these are important issues for you to be aware of and for you to consider going forward in your discussions about various issues related to flooding in Hampton. People are interested in elevating their structures, but are worried about their ability to get to and from their homes. Um, are they going to be trapped in their homes or are they going to be prevented from getting to their homes even though their homes may be elevated? Mm -hmm. So one of the questions for the Board of Selectmen is would the town consider raising roads that flood regularly? Um, mm. Again, we're not looking for answers, but it's a question that's been raised and, and we think people deserve an answer even if the answer is no, but they want to know what your position is. Uh, another question is, are town codes and ordinances keeping up with the increase in flooding activity and if they are not? Should they be? Mm. Hmm. Um, additional feedback. Uh, residents voice a common concern about the amount of relief granted from zoning ordinances in flood prone areas. Yeah. The concern comes from the potential impacts to their property that may be caused by relief granted to adjacent or nearby properties. Yeah. And the big question is, is there a way to determine if those concerns are well founded? And if so, what actions can or should be taken um, to alleviate those concerns? Sure. Drainage is also on the minds of many residents. Uh, we know there are two warrant articles, as Chris referred to earlier, uh, from DPW this year related to drainage issues and that work on those projects is moving forward. Um, and the hope is that the results from those drainage studies can provide or start to provide information about how to improve drainage in flood pr prone areas, not just in the neighborhoods that are the subject of those warrant articles, but in every area that in Hampton that is subject to flooding. Um, and residents also wondered if the town would take a position on any of these issues. Would the town consider constructing barriers such as flood walls, berms, tide gates, et cetera, in some situations that can help protect properties? 
would the town consider limiting development in yeah. flood prone areas to provide for better water storage, flood water storage? Would the town consider providing tax rebates to help property owners recover from or deal with flooding? Either on a proactive or in the recovery on a proactive basis or in the recovery process, yeah. and would the town help to secure state and federal loans to help flooded property owners with the cost of recovery? Yeah. We know from some of you and and from a lot of residents that we've spoken to that a lot of questions have been raised about FEMA's hazard mitigation grants. Yeah. We know it's not an easy process. We know it's not a quick process. Um, but we wonder if perhaps the state mitigation officer, Whitney Welsh, should be invited to meet with you folks at some point to explain the process and discuss the assistance that her office might be able to provide. So now we wanted to move into kind of some next steps. Um, so one of the outcomes of the Flood Smart Workshop that I'm really looking forward to um, is going to start in uh, early two. 2019, uh, Shea will be hosting an ongoing series of Flood Smart Roundtable meetings. Uh, and this is in an effort to continue the, the discussion on coastal flooding. Um, we will let property owners drive these discussions by suggesting topics they want to learn more about and questions they'd like to have answered. Uh, we'll bring in local or regional experts in the appropriate fields to help provide additional information and guidance. Uh, the meetings will be free of charge and will be open to anyone who is interested in the topic. Um, you'll see up on the screen there's the Shea website. Anyone that's interested in attending the roundtable discussion should visit the Shea website and sign up for the bi-monthly newsletter. Um, I know after some of those workshops we had an opportunity to interact with some of the um, attendees and you know I think there's there's people out there who could really benefit from having someone come in and explain how to read their flood insurance policy. You know, we learned from that conversation with um, the property owner that experienced flooding that there's a lot of details in those policies mm -hmm. that you might not realize and when you're actually in that flood insurance claim, all of those yeah. details become very important. So helping people to just better educate themselves on things that they can do to their home, but even, you know, understanding their flood insurance policy and whatever other topics they're interested in, I think, is really going to be um, helpful. One of the, um, I wanted, we wanted to share with you some recent work uh, that's going on. Um, this is a resilient tidal crossing project that is um, being done by the New Hampshire DES Coastal Program, and it's involved assessing all of the 120 tidal crossings on the seacoast. Yeah. Now a tidal crossing is a culvert or a bridge that allows um, mm -hmm. tidal waters to flow yeah. underneath. Um, this project was funded by NOAA and DES teamed up with uh, UNH uh, and the Nature Conservancy to analyze and manage the data. Uh, each tidal crossing was mapped, measured, and inspected and they also took the distances and elevations from the culvert or from the crossing to the road or adjacent yeah. salt marsh and uh, stream bed. And what I think is particularly valuable about this information is that it can be used by municipalities to help prioritize future culvert replacement projects and also the information in there could be used to support any um, grant applications mm -hmm. for those projects. Uh, when the study is finalized, the information about each tidal crossing will be available electronically. So it's something that could be downloaded into our um, GIS system. Um, and then next, um, we wanted to just share with you um, some of the um, proposed warrant articles that the Conservation Commission has for 2019. Uh, we often joke that as soon as the vote happens in March, we always have a new business item to start talking about warrant articles. It's something you can never seem to get an early enough start on, and yeah. so we're always brainstorming throughout the year, and we're always keeping a list of potential projects. So um, this year we have three potential warrant articles. Um, each of these have been presented to the planning board, yeah. and as of right now, two out of the three have been um, accepted by them to go to public hearing. Um, the first one um, that we proposed has to do with the floodplain ordinance. And as you may know, a few years ago, we um, revised our floodplain ordinance to include the concept of freeboard. Mm -hmm. 
Um, freeboard is kind of an additional margin of safety that's applied to the um, base flood elevation that's shown on the FEMA flood insurance rate maps. Um, base flood elevation is the minimum elevation that FEMA wants that first finished floor and all the, ele mm -hmm. all the mechanicals to be elevated to such that it's going to be less prone to flooding. Um, so right now uh, we have a mandatory one foot of freeboard and we allow that if in the elevation of the structure or construction of a new structure you're going to bump up against the height maximum, you're allowed to take that one foot that's associated with the freeboard and add it to the maximum height. So what the commission was, um, as Jade noted, we've been seeing more applications this year for people that are interested in elevating their structure. So what we wanted to do was provide some flexibility. So what we're proposing is we're leaving it at one foot of mandatory freeboard, but we're providing the opportunity to go up to three feet. Yeah. And by providing that um, additional um, elevation, we are also suggesting that they could put up to three feet on yeah. that maximum height. Now they can't just add three feet, it has to be associated with elevating yeah, it right. to meet that yeah. base flood elevation. It's not just a reason to get right. your building three feet higher. Okay. Um, and so that one, um, the planning board was very supportive of and uh, you know we look forward to moving forward with that one. Um, the second one is within our um, wetland conservation district section and also in the dimensional requirements table. Um, right now the regulation regulation says that if you are creating a new lot of record or uh, increasing the number of dwelling units, you have to have 75% of that minimum uh, lot area requirement outside of the wetland conservation district. Yeah. And our revision is we want to have 100% of it Good. outside of the wetland conservation Good. district. Um, so that one has also been um, accepted by the planning to planning board to move forward. Mm -hmm. The last one we are um, still working on, um, but conceptually, this would be another revision to the uh, wetland conservation district, and it would only apply to tidal wetlands. And that our wetland conservation district is that first feet, 50 feet from the edge of a tidal wetland. Mm. And what we are looking to do is for new construction or substantial improvements. Substantial improvement is um, a project that equals 50% uh, or more of the assessed building's value. Um, that in either of those situations, um, that uh, structure would have to be elevated on pilings yes. to allow the unobstructed flow of water underneath that building. And one of the reasons we felt that this was important is that first 50 feet, I mean, those structure, structures are right on the front line of flooding. They are the first ones to experience yeah. it. And it seems to make sense to do what we can to get those structures up out of the, the flood prone, prone areas. Um, lastly, I think um, Shay and the New Hampshire Coastal Program once again partnered um, together um, on a grant application from the Consensus Building Institute in part to continue the work we started in the summer flooding workshops. We were fortunate enough to be uh, awarded that grant and the grant enables us to begin a long-term process of researching and guiding the development of co coastal adaptation strategies to cope with coastal flooding from high tide storm surges and sea level rise in Hampton. To start, we're performing a situation assessment to better understand flooding impacts, costs, concerns and experiences in Hampton as well as impacts and solutions from other communities around the country. One of the first steps we've taken was to create a survey to help get answers from Hampton residents and town officials about flooding issues <coughs> and, and to date about 60 of those surveys have been completed and returned. Uh, we're also conducting interviews with select municipal officials and town residents mm -hmm. to further develop our knowledge and to create that situation mm -hmm. uh, assessment. The results of this assessment will help inform a future effort to convene a meeting of residents, property owners, town employees, board members, businesses, and other stakeholders in Hampton. Uh, and the purpose of this gathering is to evaluate a range of strategies to, quote, keep the water out, live with water, <laughs> or get out of the water's way at the property and town-wide levels. The ultimate goal of this process is to empower property owners and municipal officials to plan for community-wide adaptation. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
we don't know the extent to which flooding ad adaptation strategies will be needed in Hampton in the near or distant future. But we feel it's critically important for the town to have discussed and adopted appropriate strategies so that we will all be better prepared to act swiftly and decisively if an unfortunate event or series of events comes our way. And our hope is that through the process of working through this grant, we'll help the town to get to that position. So that is what we've been up to. Um, I know we've come perhaps with more questions than answers uh, than you folks were looking for this evening. Um, but we think we've put on the table a variety of different issues that have come from a variety of different sources, most of which are your fellow residents in Hampton. And we'd we'll be happy to entertain any questions yeah. that you may have. I have, I have a quick question. Any, func any focus on the river and the dredging or not in the harbor? Um, we haven't as of yet. We don't know exactly what the process of dredging is going to be. We don't know when it's going to take place. We don't know exactly how it's going to be dredged. No, but is, I mean, is there any uh, discussion or thought on frequency of dredging, which hasn't been any too wonderful, or, uh, you know, the responsibility and the flooding, because the river can flood upstream. It's not just the oceanfront that floods. The river floods, too, when you go in there. So I would think that somebody needs to be taking a look at the dredging and the frequency of dredging and why the hell you can't get the Coast Guard in here to do some dredging of the, of the river. That hasn't been addressed to date, but perhaps that is something that can be incorporated into the discussion. So something I would great. like to find out about, yes. But good job. It's, it's a lot of stuff that needs to be addressed. Yes, thank you for all that information. And to this, I mean, up till today, I had people asking me about, you know, how to apply for these grants. Yeah. So what is the best thing to say? The, um, well, help. <laughs> the town has to apply for the grants. Okay. Yeah. They can't. When you're talking about the, the FEMA hazard mitigation grants, so is this they have to come the through the town. They, they can't apply for them individually. Yeah, so I, I'll just piggyback on that. I know, um, so the hazard mitigation grant program um, is only available when we have a declared uh, presidential disaster. Um, and I believe, and I can't remember which one, if it was January or March, but one of those did qualify, and it has to do with the amount of uh, damage uh, that uh, accrued during the storm. Um, we did have an opportunity, I participated in a meeting where several FEMA um, agents came in and even um, state homeland and security uh, came in to talk about the housing <coughs> mitigation grant program. And as Jay alluded to, it's, it's not a quick process. Uh, and uh. it's a little bit of a different situation, I think, for the town. It's not commonplace. Um, as Jay said, the town has to apply on behalf of the property owner. Yeah. The funds come through the town. Yeah. There is a 25% match that is required on the um, uh -huh. property owner's part. FEMA pays 75%. Yeah. We have to, in essence, oversee a program that is occurring on private property. So wow. there's a lot of elements there that aren't <coughs> ones that we are traditionally involved in. And so when I've had people come and ask me about it, I've said you should reach out to the selectmen and share <laughs> your interest in it because I do think in order for it to be successful, we need to have a process. We have to have a criteria set up for what applications we are willing to, to support. Uh, we are going to need to allocate resources for someone to oversee these yeah. um, these grant proposals. So, so there, having I think that a meeting that you're talking about, getting everyone together would be really... I yeah. think it would That's be really helpful. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Because okay. I do think it's a great resource out there, and it's one, if we can come up with that process, yeah. we should take advantage of. Yeah. But good I think work. we have a lot of questions that need to be answered Very good first. work on your Jim, part. yeah, thank you for coming. And thank you. Those workshops were great. I did attend the workshops. I know Griffin, uh, uh, Rep. Slickman Griffin was there also. Uh, mm -hmm. Mary Louise was there. They were very informative. And it was, it's, if you have more of them, people should go to it. People should pay attention to yeah. this because there's water all around yeah. us. <laughs> and it's not going away. You know, it's an interesting uh, historical fact that 4,000 years ago, 
the uh -huh. sea coast was at the Isles of Shoals. Yeah. That was the shoreline. Yeah. And 16,000 years ago, it was 22 miles inland. Yeah. So see, it moves around. It moves around, and, and there's no way you're going to you know, stop it from moving around. You can Marcus. mitigate it, and we better be more proactive than reactive. Yeah. Yeah. Is, but you, you guys do a great job. Thank you very much. Yeah. Other nature. The Planning Commission, too, is somehow involved. The Rockingham Planning Commission, are they involved in this? Or? They well, definitely um, do a lot of settings. Like they did the Tides to Storms Vulnerability right. Assessment, which has some fantastic maps that looked at some of the different um, sea level rise scenarios and then combined them with storm surge. So yeah. um, I would encourage people to take a look at those maps because they show where this flooding can go. And, and yeah. uh, you know, as Jim said, we are surrounded by water and it's, it's coming in if you look at some of those projections. So okay. Thank you. Uh, they have great research. Okay. Now we can look at your